Okay, so I'm recording. I'm now going to mute everyone. Oh, no. Ah, goodbye. <laughs> and as usual, if you have any questions or anything, just raise your hand. I'm going to be monitoring that as we go. And Tom, over to you. Oh, <laughs> I think I just muted Tom. Tom, you back? Ah, uh, yes. Good evening, all. Yes, you did mute me. Thanks, the David. Thanks, everyone, for attending. We're going to discuss the wonderful topic of instruments. So to start off with, I'd like you to just think about which instruments are required in an aircraft when you go flying. There are four instruments that Transport Canada mandates. I'll cross over to the slide and see if you got any of these. You've got to have an altimeter in the plane, so you've got to have some idea of how high you are above the ground. You've got to have an airspeed indicator. You've got to have a direction indicator or a compass. And believe it or not, you're going to have a timepiece of some form, a clock or a watch. So just keep those in mind whenever you go flying to make sure you have those instruments with you amongst all the other host of documentation that you're also required to have in the, in the aircraft. The instruments we're going to be discussing today that we find in a modern glider are the yaw string, the slip and balance indicator, which you generally don't find in a glider but more in power planes, the pitot-static system, which is uh, the interconnectivity of the altimeter, the airspeed indicator, and the variometer. And also direction finding equipment, the compass, and we'll just briefly touch on GPS and other software integrated equipment. So starting off with the yaw string, it is um, by far a primary flight instrument. It is the most primary flight instrument that you can find. It's this little string that you see on the front of the glider over there. It's also probably the world's first heads-up display, with it's right there when you need it. Um, there's almost no delay in it. It tells you the, the, the uses for it are to give you an indication of whether you're flying cleanly and straight through the air. If it's off to one side or off to the other side, there are, you, you, you're really flying buffeting the airstream with the side of the aircraft, uh, not flying cleanly, you'll have less, less performance, etc. Following in on that, if this, if this string were out to the left-hand side, let me just see if I can erase these. So if the string were out to this side like that, uh, sorry, if I, I apologize, I'll, I'll turn, turn that back again. If the string were out, you're turning to the left and the string is out pointing to the right like that. It's going to indicate that you're actually slipping the aircraft in. The nose is not going to be following in the turn. You're going to have to correct that by either either the rudder or the ailerons. Similarly, if the yaw string were out to the left in a left-hand turn, you'd be skidding into the turn. You'd have too much rudder in. The aircraft would want to fall in on the left wing. Uh, your string helps you, as I said earlier, with flight path correction to make sure you're actually flying straight through the air, cleaving it neatly. Uh, you use a rudder opposite to the yaw string for deflection. So if the yaw string happens to be out to the left in a left-hand turn, you would use right rudder on this side to um, correct that string into the into the center again. And similarly, in the same same as what we, we said over here, with the string out to that side, you don't have enough left rudder. You'll use left rudder on this side over here to increase or to bring the string back into the center. Just as a matter of interest, uh, you can use the aileron to do the same thing. Uh, but you would use aileron in the same direction as what the string was out. So really what you're doing is you're putting the aircraft into a neutral balance. If you're in a spin, as a matter of interest on this one, the string will always point to the inside of the turn. So it could be one way to try and recognize a spin. Probably not the easiest and not the quickest way. 
I said the next thing we would look at would be the turn and slip indicator or the balance ball, etc. This we see mainly in powered aircraft, although the, the one you see on the left-hand side over here is actually a turn and slip indicator from a glider. What happens is that it works opposite to the yaw string. It indicates um, the direction of the total force, the weight plus the centrifugal force in relation to the aircraft. It reacts opposite to the yaw string. Slip, slip points in the direction of the slip. Skid points in the direction of the skid. Exactly opposite to what you saw in the yaw string. Um, to get the ball centered again, instead of putting uh, putting rudder in on the opposite side of the string, you'd actually literally kick the ball or step on the ball. If the ball were out to the right, you would put right rudder, it would move the ball back into the center. In a spin, it's usually but not always deflected outwards. Um, just at this point, um, David, if we could unmute. Uh, any questions on that little section that we did on the your string and directional control? So if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand. No, no hands going up, so I think we're good, Tom. Okay, we'll continue. The next thing we need to, to know about um, aircraft instrumentation is what they are and how, how, how it's all put together. So what you're seeing right now is a big picture of the pitot-static system. Every one of the instruments in your aircraft is connected to the static system that you can see in this section over here. The static pressure has no is the pressure that is sensed on the side of the aircraft or in any area of the aircraft where there is no influence on it by motion in the air. So it's not ram pressure, it is literally just the outside air pressure. In the worst case scenario, it could literally be an open tube inside the cockpit. And some aircraft do have switches that allow for that to be done in case of icing on the outside. The second part of pressure that we have is dynamic pressure, and that's pressure that's created due to movement through the air, generally going into your pitot tube and giving you being fed to your airspeed indicator to give you an indication of airspeed. So let's look at the pitot tube and its connections. The pitot tube is always set up in the direction of flight, so it's getting ram air. It is being fed air due to the motion of the aircraft through the air. Um, this, of course, is influenced by wind. Um, headwind will increase the, the will increase the pressure. The tailwind will decrease the pressure. The static ports, as I mentioned before, are shielded from direct pressure. All three instruments are connected to the static um, ports. And this allows for equalization of the pressure inside the cases of each of the instruments. Each instrument is fairly delicate. It's encased in a nice solid case. And the venting hole of the, the case is generally to the static. The airspeed indicator, of course, has got a, a probe on it or a connection point on it that is connected directly to the pitot tube. It's a note here that all, so yeah, all ports can easily be blocked, which will lead to partial or inaccurate readings. We have had on more than one occasion at the our club at Great Lakes that either the pitot tube or the static tube or both have become the home to mud wasps. And it's a hell of a job to get that clear before you go flying. It's also very interesting when you take off and you suddenly realize you don't have any airspeed. Right, getting on to the next first of the instruments under discussion, we'll look at the altimeter. The altimeter really is a sealed aneroid chamber that is geared to a pointer and connected to the static pressure on the outside. Oh, I think I went too far. I went in the wrong direction there. 
So as the as the um, pressure moves from dense to less dense, the air that is trapped inside the diaphragm or the aneroid chamber expands because the pressure outside of it decreases, therefore driving the needle in a clockwise direction, indicating you're going up. As we all know, air pressure decreases with height. Right. So in, in your uh, animated graphic there, Tom, um, the dark blue would represent air. So as we get higher, there's less air, and hence that, that aneroid diaphragm expands. Absolutely. Yeah, and you can, actually, it, yes. you can actually, um, if you're flying in an airliner, you can have a little bit of fun with this. Uh, take your, your plastic water bottle that you picked up at the in the terminal, drink half the water in it, seal it, and then wait till you get up to cruising altitude and crack it open, and you'll you'll have a, a psh of air pressure come out, and then seal it again, and wait till you land, and you'll find that your 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 bottle is actually collapsing in on itself because of the uh, lower air pressure when you're up at altitude, and then when you come and land, it actually pushes it down. So it's doing exactly what they're talking about here. All right, Lead, leading on from that, um, Altimeter is made up of various parts, and Occasionally, there's a little bit of confusion that comes in, and we'll try and explain to you guys all what these are. First of all, you have the subscale. It's that scale around, or the scale that's around the outside of the um, of the instrument, all around here. And it's in feet or in meters, depending on what aircraft you're flying. Uh, and mostly in North America, you'll find that the the uh, it is set to feet. In Europe, you'll find often that it's set to meters, and the gliders are using kilometers, which makes it a lot easier to do final glide calculations. Second thing is this little area inside here called the subscale, the ultimate subscale, which can either be in inches of mercury or in millibars, and it is a way of setting the altimeter if, say, air traffic control has given you a specific pre air pressure for the day. You'd also use that if you were flying quite high into the flight level air, um, flying area, and you'd be setting it to standard atmospheric pressure, which is 29.92 millibars of mercury. Now we have three pointers sitting over here. <coughs> The long pointer, this little fellow over here, that one over there, the long pointer, reads essentially feet or hundreds of feet. So 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. The short little pointer, this fellow over here, increases in thousands. If, if it gets to the point where it's pointing at one, it would read 1,000 feet etc. all the way to 10,000, then 11,000. And that's where this long pointer here with the triangle comes in. By the time you get to 10,000 feet, that one would have moved all the way to there to show you that you are 10,000 feet. The last thing that you have over there is the subscale adjustment knob. This knob directly controls the um, altimeter subscale that you set over there. Right, getting back to this is a close-up view of the the subscale, which has been set to 29.92 inches of mercury over there. So what does the altimeter actually tell you when you're using it in flight? It can tell you whether you're going up or down. If it's turning clockwise, it's indicating that the aircraft is increasing in altitude, you're going up. If it's going anti-clockwise, you're going down. So it's an easy instrument to see whether you're really going up or down. It's not as accurate as any of the other instruments we'll be getting to later on. It can also tell you if there's a change in air pressure. So let's say you were sitting on the ground and it was reading at our club 840 feet. 
And as the day gets warmer, um, it starts reading that we're higher. So all that it's telling you there is that the air pressure has become lower and the chamber has managed to expand more. So as the air warms up, the air pressure becomes lower. Similarly, you can have the same thing with a decrease. So here's a little question for you guys, Dave, if you wouldn't mind unmuting or whatever way people can answer this so, question. So here's how we'll answer the question. Okay. Type in the question box the answer to the question. So go ahead, Tom. OK, the qu question is, what is this altimeter reading? Now that I've told you what all the pointers stand for. <clears throat> so I'll just give them a, a few minutes. OK. Yeah, I'm not used to using the system, so <laughs> learning as we go. All right. So it is coming in fast and furious. And, and the reason, Tom, I wanted to get people to, to type it in instead of talk it is so that, that we get several people a chance to answer without hearing the other answers. And so here's the numbers I'm getting. 1,400, 1,400, 1,420, 1,420, 1,400, 1,420. And from Arthur, he's saying 29.92 pressure. Oh, OK. Which, which right, Arthur, Arthur is absolutely start. correct. <laughs> Yes, so Arthur, starting with you, the altimeter subscale is reading 29.92, which means the altimeter has been set to standard atmospheric pressure. From all the other answers, 1420 is actually what it's reading. 1400 is pretty damn close, not bad at all. But as you can see, it is really just that little bit over over there, which gives you a division of 20 more. All right, there are a couple more of these, so let's try this one. Once again, type your answers, and they will give them back to me. Oh, people are being more accurate this time. Uh, it's a good thing. They're all, they're all catching 20 the 20. Feet matters. <laughs> well, you know, when you're at 3,600 feet, though, so they're all saying 3,620, every one of them. Okay, fabulous. And, Perfect. Okay, another, another one coming up. And Sergio was the only one to put the comma in. Everyone else just typed 3600, but that's cool. <laughs> All right. How's about this one? Well, we're, we're all being very accurate today. This is awesome. 840 through the board. Chris Andrews adding 840 GLGC. This is, this, is, this is quite interesting with you group of students. I've had times where you've done this and the guys would not figure this out at all. So here's the last one. What do we see here? Ooh, a little slower coming in on this one. <laughs> We've caught a couple people. Oh, Dane just yeah, said no. <laughs> All right, so here are the numbers we're getting. Uh, 18,600, uh, 10,860, 10,860, 18,600, 18,620, and 1860. Okay. 1860. I don't know how you get 1860 other just, than you forgot that the outer scale is reading in hundreds of feet. He it just, is, in fact, 18,600. So let's corrected. look at this. Dangerous. Let, 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 you did. You did correct. Let, 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 OK, let's look at this. So what you've got here is you've got that long pointer I spoke to you about, which, which counts in thousands, uh, in 10,000. So if it would be 1, that would be 10,000 already. And if it had gotten to here, it would be 20,000. So we know it's 10,000 and something. So it's getting up there. It probably should have been even a little bit more in this direction if I if I'd done it more accurately. So you've got 10,000 sitting there plus take the, this pointer here, your your thousands pointer. So um, sorry, uh, yeah, your thousands pointer. So that becomes your another eight, 18,000, and then your hundreds pointer here, which is at six, so 18,600. Now, the chances of you getting there in southern Ontario are few and far between, but one day when you guys all go flying wave, maybe out in Alberta area, yes, you can get to this quite easily. 
with a little chat to air traffic control. Hopefully that'll allow you through. So getting back to a couple of terms and definitions that are associated with the altimeter. First of all, we get true altitude. If somebody says to you the true altitude, what they mean is height above sea level. If you've been being given an absolute altitude, it is the height that you are above the terrain at that point. So a G L above ground level and the previous one would it be ASL. Then you get something called pressure altitude and this you really only get into when you're dealing with air traffic control and you're flying IFR. Um, they ask you to set the altimeter to 29.92 after a specific altitude which allows all aircraft to be set to that level. So all aircraft are referencing the same thing and they can maintain vertical separation. If one of the aircraft was actually trying to fly above sea level, it could be out by a couple of hundred feet, maybe even a thousand feet, purely due to temperature, etc., and the air pressure of the day. Indicated altitude, one, one more altitude definition. It's the altitude that you see on your instrument when you set it for the local barometric pressure. And the last of the alt altimeter definitions is density altitude. It's actually the pressure altitude that's corrected for temperature. As we said, the hotter the air becomes, the less dense it becomes, and the higher you really are. So we'll take an example of this. All aircraft performance tables, etc., are based on this pressure altitude thing because it affects the takeoff run, the climb rate, the tow rate, the, la uh, the <coughs> climb rate on tow and the landing roll, etc. For example, here's the formula for density altitude. It's your pressure altitude, so it's the altitude that you really think you're at, plus 120 times the actual temperature in Celsius minus standard atmospheric temperature, which is 15 degrees. So I'm going to give you a little example here of how things can change on a hot day in southern Ontario. So the temperature is now 30 degrees, and the altimeter is set to 29.92, basically, and you're 2,500 feet above the ground. If you do that little computation for the density altitude, you actually find that the air that you in feels like it's at 4,300 feet, which means your performance has decreased. So you've got to watch out for, for a decrease in, in towing, climb rate, etc., as the day gets hotter. Little summary on the altimeter. It's connected to the atmosphere via static ports. There's a sealed dia diaphragm or, or aneroid wafer inside. Pressure decrease it causes the wafer to expand, leading to clockwork motion of the indicator needles. There are single hand, a single hand and the two and three handed instruments. You find them all on the market, calibrated in feet or in meters. Two of the hands are hundreds of feet and thousands of feet. The third hand indicates tens of thousands of feet. And also, which I failed to show you earlier on, in the lower portion of the airspeed indicator, a diagonally striped area will appear after 10,000 feet. A few things to keep in mind about the altimeter and how it reacts. When you're moving from an area of high pressure to low pressure, or warm to cool um, area, the, the altimeter tends to read high, it tends to overread. Similarly, if you're moving from low pressure to high pressure, cool to warm, it tends to read low. So it's a re reading too low. So from high to low, watch out below, because if you're coming from high to low, the altimeter is going to say you're a lot higher than what you really are. And you might think you're two, three hundred feet above the ground coming back on across country. Uh, or 1,300 feet above the ground if we really had to do this properly, and you're probably only at 1,000. And this happens quite regularly as the day progresses. And, and just to, to, 
if Tom, if I can just chime in for just a second, this kind of builds on our, our question that we had earlier around the circuit when you're looking out as opposed to reading your uh, altimeter. So you've arrived back after a five hour cross country flight and there could be a significant pressure change from when you took off. So that could mean you're either reading high or low, hence you might end up coming in 200 feet too high or 200 feet too low. It's much better if you're just looking out and judging it at that point. Yeah, absolutely. You'll, you'll soon learn how to recognize how high you are from the size of the cars or the trees below you, etc. But the other thing to note is if you've misset the ultimate to subscale, if somebody's given you a um, millibar reading to set on it, 0.1 inch of, um, of mercury error in the altimeter puts you off by approximately 100 feet. So just be careful when you're setting it that way around. Next, we come to the airspeed indicator. But once again, um, raise your hands if you have any questions that like anything explained a bit better on that. And David, let me so, know if there are any. So we do have a question, actually, from Neil. Um, does density altitude affect the altimeter reading? No, density altitude does not affect the altimeter reading other than the fact that if the air was getting warmer, it's going to be less dense, so the altimeter is going to read a little bit higher, but it's not going to give you the density altitude reading. The density altitude that's referred to there is a reference of, the, of how an aircraft would perform. So we're saying instead of performing at 2,500 feet, uh, that type of performance, because it's gotten to 30 degrees that day, consider as if you were another 2,000 feet higher. The, the um, altimeter is still going to read 2,500 feet, because you've probably set it for that. Does that work for you? Yeah, it does. I'm just going to unmute Neil for just a second. Neil, does that def uh, description make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the yeah, question. That's a good question. Yeah, Neil, what I'm trying to get to there is please be aware of those hot days. We've had occasions where the 2,000-foot strip that we on gets a little bit short on takeoff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've... I've uh, I've seen the effects of, of uh, temperature and um, the altitude density, um, and the fact that the, the air or the uh, altimeter doesn't really react the same way as the flight surfaces of the aircraft also helps me understand how some of the pilots that I've seen in trouble got there. Okay, that's, that's that's very interesting. Remember, the ultimate is only going to tell you what you what, what you've set it to. It's not going to suddenly, as the day increases, from uh, standard atmospheric temperature of 15 to 30 degrees, uh, do the swing of 2,000 feet. It's probably only swing four or 500 feet due to that. Yeah. And and really, the altimeter's purpose in life is to tell us how far how high above sea level and hence how high above ground level we are. So when we're sitting on the field at, at, at either Winnipeg or, or Great Lakes and we dial in that 800 and, and change, um, you know, if we've got that, that hot day with really thin air, our, our altimeter is still saying 820 because that's what we tell it to, that's what we want it to tell us, right? Because we, we want it to tell us how high above the ground we are. But with that thinner air, you know, we're going to need more air over the wings. We're going to need, you know, more air over the prop. And there's less air in those cylinders to create power. And, and this is why when we get to the end of that runway, we're only just getting over the trees as opposed to, you know, uh, being that height halfway down the runway on a cold fall day, right? So, yeah, great question. Thanks. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. you're also going to notice um, increase in humidity will do a similar thing to you. This will all get covered, I'm pretty sure, further down in the MET part of the course. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into some detail there on MET. <clears throat> all right, before we go into the break, we'll do the, the last of the easy ones, um, the airspeed indicator, where the variometer that follows that can be a little bit taxing, but we can talk for a while on that. So this is what the common or garden variety of speed indicator in the glider looks like. Um, this one is in knots, as we can see from 
right inside there it says knots behind that. So this one is calibrated in knots, which is 1.85 times kilometers. Right. Once again, we have an aneroid chamber that, as you can notice in that diagram, seems to have the air inside it becoming more dense. Well, the reason for that is that it, that, that little chamber that's expanding over there is lit literally connected to the pitot tube. It's ram air pressure coming in. Reference a little diagram on the side there. You've got the pressure coming in here straight into that, which would be the same as coming straight into the back of this diaphragm. And the more air, the more it's winding up that needle. So this is the equivalent um, of us blowing up a balloon. Yeah, very much so, yes. So, um, as we can see, slow, there's less pressure on it. Fast, there'll be more pressure on it, and that's how that little thing works. There's a picture of it, a cutout diagram. I'll bring the mouse across here. Effectively, you've got your ram air pressure coming in through the pitot, which is pushed through a set of tubes into the back of the diaphragm. The diaphragm can expand. It drives a little arm, which in turn moves another little arm, which rotates the indicator dial. These things are very nice to look at inside if you ever have the chance. What we normally used to do when this was done live was we'd bring a couple of open instruments along. They're very pretty inside. So, the airspeed indicator it measures speed, or it indicates speed relative to the air. Peter is connected to the one side of the diaphragm, and the whole case itself, the entire case itself, is connected to the static. The instrument is measuring the difference between dynamic pressure, which is pressure due, due to the movement through the air, and the static pressure that you have surrounding the aircraft. This gets translated into the movement of the dial, calibrated in knots, kilometers an hour, or miles per hour. And Tom, uh, we have a quick question. Sure. Um, the question is, what is RAM air? RAM air is that air that's getting forced into the front of the pitot tube, into the orifice of the pitot tube. It's literally the air being rammed into that hole. That's RAM air pressure. Okay. And this is the reason why pitot tubes always face forwards. Yes, pitot tubes are always aligned in line with the aircraft and placed as far away as possible from any obstructions. Right. So on a lot of gliders, so, they stick them out in the nose. Um, like our Crosno, where we've got that pitot tube right in the very dead center there, the air vent right out in the nose. Yeah, and on the on the modern um, glass ships, it will probably be built into the tube that's sitting on the tail, mm -hmm. way out of the airflow. Yeah, and your diagram there, if you just go back one for a second. Certainly. There we are. So this would be a diagram of a, a typical power plane pitot tube because what they do is they bolt them to the underside of the wing outside of the propeller arc, right? That's the section here that gets bolted outside yep. the wing. Yeah, so we want to get it outside of the propeller arc so that we're not measuring the ram air of the propeller being pushed back, but the actual air that the airplane is, is moving through. So I'm just going to unmute Dane for a second. Dane, did that answer it for you? Oh yeah, I just thought that it might be like RAM stop starts for or you know stands for something. Oh, like an acronym. Yeah. No, I, yeah, so no, just it, I get it. Yeah. It cool. doesn't, and it has nothing to do with trucks either. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, we need to talk about the how the airspeed indicator is marked, and the airspeed indicator is marked for a variety of really, really good reasons. I'll go through them one at a time, but as you can see here, there is, I'll quickly draw on this, there's a white arc here, there's a green arc over here, there's a yellow arc over there, and there's this little line over there called the red line, and now I'll erase all those things if I can figure out how to do it. So, let's look at the white arc. Now, the white arc you're only going to see in high-performance gliders. 
or aircraft with flaps. And this holds true for all airplanes. The white arc is the flap operating range. And it is normally below, the, it extends below the green arc and into the green arc. The beginning of that white range is VSO. It is the stall speed in landing configuration with the flap out. So if you look at the instrument itself, stall speed as you put the flaps out becomes lower because normally your stall speed is at the end of the green, which we'll get to now as well. The upper end of the white arc, which is right over here, can you can you see the mouse on the screen there, David? I'm not sure. Yes, I am seeing it. So, okay. um, uh, so, so we've got that. that. That is the maximum speed at which you're allowed to extend your flaps, and that is purely from the build of the aircraft. If the aircraft, if you're going faster than, than that and you start extending your flaps, you're going to start either breaking the hinges, breaking the flap, the flap might not take the pressure, etc. Your next speed range is the green arc. And there you get something called VS1 or normally VS at the beginning of the green arc. It's the, the green arc is the range that you operate the aircraft in 99% of the time. VS1 or V stall, it's uh, the stall speed of the aircraft flapped and gear retracted. So it's a complete an aircraft in flying mode, not in landing mode. That's the speed you'll find that will you'll start noticing when you get the stall buffet appearing when you're doing um, flying in the air doing doing your stall practice. And and that would include spoilers retracted. Absolutely, spoilers retracted. Everything else clean. Absolutely nothing else in there. The the rest of the range is the and up to V and O is up to the normal operating range speed. So in this case, in just about any air condition, you could be flying anything from 50 all the way through to 118 and not do any structural damage to the aircraft. The next arc that comes in is the yellow arc or the caution range, and in this range of speeds. You never, ever fly the aircraft in rough air. It is the not rough air speed. You don't do abrupt stick movements, etc., change of direction and all of that. This is high speed flying. You will overstress the aircraft fairly quickly if you do that. And finally, at the top end of the yellow arc is a little red line known as velocity never exceed. What they're trying to tell you there is if you go a lot faster than that, you're going to bring upon uh, the aircraft structural damage. Flutter could start happening. The wingtips could start flapping on you and then generally flutter all the way down to the cockpit. In some of the very long-winged aircraft, that flutter actually results in the aircraft's wings breaking up from the tips inwards all the way down to the fuselage. Um, where there is actually one one recorded event like that where the debris of the aircraft was found over four four kilometers as it broke itself to pieces along the straight line. Right, what does the the airspeed indicator tell you? Well, for starters, it'll confirm whether you're speeding up or slowing down. It's not always incredibly instant, but yes, it will tell you whether you're speeding up or going, slowing down. It'll give you an indication of how close you're getting to the stall. Suddenly you see you're in a nice tight thermal, and you see you, you're hovering around the thermal line over here, that little triangle that you see where I'm pointing now is normally your best thermaling speed. And notice your green range ends just about at the same place over there, so always close to the stall. Gives you a good indication of that. Gives you, gives you an indication of approaching V&E on the other side when you're getting to that red line. Don't go there and remember, um, as the air gets thinner, higher up the airspeed indicator tends to um, underread. So you will be going a hell of a lot faster than 200 and whatever, this 260 over here at 10,000 feet in the aircraft will have fallen apart. So Tom? Also, yeah. 
Um, with that in mind, how would we know then if we're at, you know, let's say 10,000 feet and we've got a VNE of, what is that, about 260, um, how would we know what our VNE is at 10,000 feet? David, I believe there is a calculation for that. The, I can't put it on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, so it's, it's actually, the, you'll find in your pilot operating handbook, there's a chart and it will tell you what your aircraft's um, VNE is at various altitudes. And if you look on the side of the Crosno, on the right-hand side, when you get in, there's actually a chart and you'll see this graph line that goes up um, and it charts airspeed versus altimeter or sorry, height versus airspeed for VNE. Um, so you'll actually find it in your, uh, th there is a calculation for it, but it does vary per aircraft. Um, so most aircrafts, they publish it right in the, the pilot operating manual. A couple of definitions associated with the airspeed indicator and the airspeed in general. You have something called indicated airspeed. It's exactly what you see on the dial of the airspeed indicator. Per definition, uncorrected speed read directly from the airspeed dial. Then you get something called calibrated airspeed. You very rarely see this ever being mentioned in gliders, but definitely in powered aircraft. It's that very self-same indicated airspeed that you saw over there, but it's corrected for errors in the instrument or installation position of the pitot tube. Remember David mentioned earlier on that the pitot on powered planes is put outside of the propeller arc. Let's say the guy is screwed it in there, screwed it one degree out to the right. There's going to be an error, error creeping in there. All performance data of aircraft, in fact, is associated with calibrated airspeed. So what the airspeed indicator is telling you as I said, um, in gliders, because of the ability to position things very cleanly in the, the path of the air, indicated airspeed and calibrated airspeed are pretty much the same thing. Then you get true airspeed, which is the calibrated airspeed corrected for the density error. So true airspeed is the speed that your aircraft is moving through the air mass. Once again, let's take this to what we spoke about being at 10,000 feet and V&E literally being reduced. The air is thinner, the true airspeed that you're flying at will have reduced. Well, 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 in fact, the true airspeed will be 200 and whatever, 260, but the indicated airspeed will be very different to that. And equivalent airspeed, something we don't do use at all in gliding has to do with the compressibility factor of the air. And as I say, it's not an issue, an issue below 250 knots. Uh, all instruments have errors. I probably missed an error on the altimeter. Um, because gliders don't shake and rattle and roll like power planes, you normally find the airspeed indicator takes a little while, or the altimeter takes a little while before it indicates a change. Similarly, we have problems with um, air density. So here we say errors that we find air density are 2% of the indicated airspeed for every 10, every 1,000 feet of pressure altitude. There's so if you think, there's the formula I was talking about earlier on. So I'll highlight, if you were at 30,000 feet, you take 10% of 30,000, which is, uh, you take it in thousands, so you take the 30 part of it, your indicated airspeed is 100 knots. So that gives you 100 there, plus 2% of 100, and you work that all out, Instead of doing 100 knots, you are actually doing 160 knots. Now, 10,000 feet or 30,000 feet is fairly high. But bring this all back to 10,000 feet, you probably find your 20, 20 knots difference at, at 10,000 feet. So beware of all those little, little bits and pieces. The higher you go, how this changes. But that's exactly the formula we were talking about earlier on.
And once again, I refer to it over here. VNE is close to the stall, so you could you could find that the higher you get in your your speed that you can actually fly indicate, it comes all the way down. And when you're at 50, 60,000 feet, you could really have literally no difference between where the aircraft's likely to stall and being able to still fly. This is referred to as coffin corner. Um, V&E is, is an indication of how fast you can take an aircraft, but it's based on indicated on true airspeed, not on indicated airspeed. So just keep that one in mind. You have to take that V&E factor and reverse it down to whatever it should be. Errors occur in the reading on the airspeed indicator due to where it's positioned. So ideally it should be in undisturbed air. No prop wash, no wash off the top of the wing, no, no whatever should be in the way. And the position error is also written up in the flight manual. If you slip an aircraft, you'll see what happens. There's effectively, when you're slipping an aircraft, you're moving the pitot tube from being directly in line with the flight path to having an angle to the flight path. And you'll see the airspeed actually decreases. So the slip demonstrates a less than ideal placement of the, of the pitot tube. Also, very, very important. This instrument takes time to respond. You will find if you're trying to fly a specific speed in a glider and you try and nail it using the airspeed indicator, you are going to be chasing it. Because you're going to watch it and it's going to say 50 knots. And by the time you've settled yourself into level flight, it will be at 60 knots already. The, the, the instrument is slow in its operation. So rather work out how fast you're flying by looking at the distance between the top of your instrument panel and the horizon. It's way quicker, way easier, and you don't even have to look at the instrument. Other problems that we find, icing, moisture buildup in the pitot-static system can cause lower readings or a complete loss of reading. So you've got to watch out for water getting into any of the tubes, particularly the pito as it's facing directly into the oncoming air. So if you were flying in the rain, you could get water accumulation in the pipe. It will give you erratic readings on the instrument. If it's cold, it might freeze, freeze closed completely. And you might just have an airspeed of 100 knots and know that you're definitely flying a hell of a lot slower. Because it's not going to move once it's fr frozen closed. It becomes a sealed unit. Uh, that was the water that I spoke about earlier on, and now we'll get to the variometer. And I suggest at this point we take a few questions and take a little bit of a break because variometer operation, although fairly simple, takes a bit of explaining. All right, so I'm just going to unmute everyone. Just uh, click, click, click here. And everyone is muted. So are there any questions or thoughts so far? I have a question about the, the flying speed, the airspeed. Uh, Tom, you mentioned that in the very rough airs, you wouldn't like to fly in that yellow arch. But I was thinking for more general question, if you find yourself in a really, really rough air, let's say at the edge of a storm, uh, is it better off flying faster or slower? My guess would be faster because you would have more pressure on the wings and... Yeah, you're right. You'd have more control because of that, but you don't want to go into that speed range. Why? Well, the air is rough, so you could suddenly fly from a pocket of upgoing air straight into downgoing air. So think about flying on a commercial liner where suddenly the whole airplane drops and people start floating up to the up to the ceiling. The same thing happens in a glider. Your head goes up to the top of the cockpit as well. The wings start flexing abnormally. And what they're saying there is don't maneuver the aircraft or don't fly that fast when the conditions are rough like that. Because you're bound to overstress the aircraft. Okay. Thank you. So we want to stay in the green arc, but we want to be closer to the, the fast end of the green arc. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's an accurate term. 
oh, what do you call this? Description? Of the word. Description, there you go. Yes, you want, you, you, the faster you fly, the easier it is to control the airplane. It might become a little bit rough on yourself, but yeah, just don't, don't push her into the, into the limit on the other side of that arc. Great question. Were there any others before we take our break? All right, so I'm going to mute everyone. There, we're all muted. And I'm Tom, I'm just going to take the presenter control back so that I can put my timer up and show my screen. Oh, I can get rid of that. So, and I've got a little picture up here while we're, uh, while we're letting our, our 10 minute break. And uh, I'll ask you guys when we come back, why did I choose this picture? All right, we'll see you in 10 minutes.
All right, we're back. Kind of ominous having that uh, big military airplane in the background as we do our countdown here. So I'm just going to go through and unmute everyone. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back. There we go. So um, as we return, just wanted to see if anyone figured out why I chose this picture for our break. To make us jealous. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Show us the pitot tube that is right in front of the cockpit there. Pitot tube? Okay. Yeah. I can't see that. It's not Isn't a pitot tube. The, the pointy arrow looking thing? That this? one? Yeah. That one? No, that's yeah. not a pitot tube. Uh, no? Well, all right. It is what? It is the reason I, I chose the picture. Sure. Dane? Anything to do with the above sea level altitude? Correct me. No, I, I, just, I just have an echo. Is that is that a is that like a yaw string? Kind of yaw string. Dane wins the prize. Oh That's yeah, a yeah, yeah. So uh, Neil commented that uh, the U-2 spy plane has a yaw string, and in fact, most jets, uh, a lot of jet yeah. fighters, have a yaw string. Hmm. Yeah. Now, as as they're moving away from guns and towards missiles and guided rockets and all that, it's uh, it's becoming less of a thing. But uh, yeah, all right. I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Tom. Hey, Tom. <laughs> all right. Look, I've got it. I'm going to figure this one. Is that showing my screen, gentlemen? You are back Ladies. on. Yes. <laughs> like you know what oh, we're thank doing. Thank you. Right? Technology is fabulous. So, just before we mute everyone, were there any questions, comments, thoughts before we uh, turn it back over to Tom? All right. I'm going to mute everyone. So, Tom, you're on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for doing that. Thanks, David. All right. Now we're getting on to probably the one instrument that we use the most in gliding. It's called the variometer. Its predecessor would probably have been called the vertical airspeed indicator, giving us an indication of the speed we are going up and down through the air mass. The variometer is even more accurate and a much refined version of a VSI. Essentially, you have static. It's an instrument that is measuring static pressure or the movement of static pressure through the instrument, or change in static pressure, let me rather say that change in static pressure is being measured through movement of air through the instrument between the static port on the outside of the aircraft, remembering that that's not in the airflow, and a reference chamber such as a bottle inside the aircraft on the other side is a variometer. This air moves through a very small orifice and is translated into an up and down movement of the variometer needle. What I need to tell you, the picture you're seeing here is an electronic version of the standard variometer. It's fairly modern. We have some of these in our gliders. But what we're going to be discussing is something a lot simpler than that. In the early days of flying, you would actually see something that looked a little bit like this on the side of an airplane. Sometimes it was an airspeed indicator. But it's literally, it's a little ball or little balls that can get blown up in this direction over here if air enters in from the bottom, or up in this direction if air enters in from the bottom there. This side here is calibrated as the up-going side, and this side is the down-going side of the air. A variometer, oh, I just made that, that's the mouse wheel that's doing that, finally figuring that out. Uh, the instrument you see on the side here is really what a, what a proper variometer looks like in a glider, but the principles of operation are like this. So let's say that our glider is flying at a constant level, so it's neither going up nor down. Agree with me that the static air pressure is remaining constant on the outside because you aren't going up or down. So your static pressure is high on the outside and let's say it's also high on the inside in the reference chamber. The entire instrument as such is at rest with itself. The pressure is equal, there's no air movement in it. So <clears throat> We're indicating zero, neither up nor down or zero. 
No movement of the air in either direction is zero. Now let's say the glider is climbing to a higher attitude. Now think about this. As you're climbing to a higher attitude, you're going to get a decrease in static pressure. If you weren't compensating for the fact that you're pulling up with your stick in reference to a reference chamber, just literally pulling up the stick would show that you're going up, which is not telling you what you're actually doing in the air mass itself. This instrument is telling you what you're doing in the air mass. Hence the difference between a vertical airspeed indicator and a variometer. A variometer is measuring differences in static. So in this case, in this description, the glider is going to climb to a higher attitude. Therefore, the pressure, static pressure, is going to decrease. Therefore, the increased pressure that we find in the reference chamber is going to flow out and go up through here, pushing the green up ball up to equalize it to the static pressure. Notice if it were to try and flow the other way around, it would be blocked. That block ball, the red ball, is blocking the end of that tube. So therefore, we're going to get an indication of green climb. So static pressure getting lower. Reference pressure in the chamber is still high. And you're going to get the movement of the air from the reference to the other side. And you're going to get that type of air movement. Therefore, you're going to have an up indication. Similarly, the glider reaches a higher altitude. So you've got thin air in the static chamber and the same thin air in the reference chamber. Of course, you can figure out the pressures at both sides are low. There's no movement of the air. There's no climb. There's no sink. So essentially, by using this reference chamber in relation to the static pressure, you, you're um, getting rid of the indication of stick lift. Sorry, excuse me a sec. I'm just moving a cat out of the way. Um, now let's look at what happens when the glider goes down to a lower altitude. So your static pressure is going to become higher as you go down. And your reference chamber is going to be at a low pressure. Your airflow is exactly as indicated on those arrows. And you're going to see the down arrow going, or the down ball showing you that. So your needle is going to deflect down. Effectively, that is the basic, basic operation of a variometer and how it is different to a vertical airspeed indicator. Here you can see just in the animation, what happens in the two situations. You've got down going air, you're going up in the air, etc., and down going air. While we're on this slide, any questions, please raise your hands, type a question. David, let me know, because it's important to understand the principle of what we're trying to get to over here. Nope, no hands going up just yet. I think uh, give it a few more moments, and I think we might have it. Yeah, the, 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 main, the main thing to realize is that if you were to just pull the stick back in a variometer that isn't compensated or in an airspeed indicator that isn't compensated like this, it's going to show a vertical climb. But in a glider, you're not interested in the vertical climb. You're more interested to know if the air mass you're in is moving up with you. OK, so we got two hands up. Uh, Tom um, Med Meddaika, I'm going to unmute you, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick thing. Just to understand, this is a sealed unit, correct? This is not nothing to do with pet cock tubes or anything like that. It's a sealed unit itself, just acting on pressure, right? No, it's not. There's a, there's a tube, the static from the side of the aircraft is connected to. You can you can replace this vertical airspeed indicator that we have in the center over here. Let me just get a pen on this thing again. This instrument gets replaced with a variometer the minute you take another lead out of it and you hook it onto a reference bottle. Okay. So, so the reference bottle okay. end is sealed, and what the instrument's really yes. doing is it's is it's measuring. So the reference chamber in this diagram is the reference bottle that Tom's referring to. So what you're doing is you're actually measuring the flow from the outside static into the reference chamber and then the flow back out of the reference chamber. Got it. Good. I'm going to I'm going to mute you and Dane.
Dane, you there? Oh yes. Um, I wanted to know. I think I asked this question before. Do you have? Do we have the capability of getting all these slides? So, or is it all in? Or is it all in that book that I don't have? But I, I finally found a guy who has it. It's it's partially in the book that you don't have that you found a guy for, and we are going to <laughs> be PDFing all of these and and giving you a package of those. Uh, just we're, we're we're kind of what we're doing is we're um, cleaning up and and sort of doing a little bit of touching up of them just before we present. And then what we'll do is when we're done the entire session, we'll give you a, a PDF of everything. Yeah, because I was I'm, I'm trying to write down stuff and and Tom's there's still so many points and I'm, I'm missing a few and I, it's just like you know my. Yeah. Keep in mind as well, we are recording all of these sessions, and as soon as yes. I can sort out this whole YouTube channel thing, um, I will have them posted up online so you can either you know, go through your notes, go through the, the PDFs, uh, watch the, the things, or you know, ask us a question at any time. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. Cool. Okay. All right, so con continuing on from the periometer, a very, very important instrument for gliding. Uh, very, very sensitive rate of climb or rate of descent indicator. It also tells you whether you're going up in the air mass or down in the mass of air, or whether the air mass is going up. It's connected to static port and a reference chamber, which I, which I uh, showed you in the diagram earlier on. It is basically a flow meter measuring the airflow between static port and reference port. You could have put a little vein over there and have a small jet of air blasting on either side of the vein, and you'd get the right answer. Um, needle, of course, is connected via gears to the vein flow, and yes, there is a vein inside the instrument itself. It's literally, literally, literally blowing on a little square piece of metal. can be calibrated in anything you like feet per second, meters per second, knots. If you're flying an aircraft in knots, you'll probably have it in knots. If you've got it in miles, it might be in feet. If it's in meters per second, you'll definitely have an airspeed indicator in kilometers an hour because calculations are just with zeros and things there. Right, now we come to the next part, which is total energy compensation. And to try and get you through understanding why we want to even refine the variometer even more than what it's already been refined by just measuring the airflow due to going up and down. You can affect your vertical airspeed indication or your variometer indication by literally yanking back on the stick. So you're going, you think there's a thermal, you yank back on the stick wire, the variometer, if it's not compensated, will throw up massive lift, you know, five meters a second, ten knots, and you think you've struck coals in the jackpot and everything else, and the next minute you'll wonder why the ultimate is busy winding in the anti-clockwise direction. Therefore, we try and compensate the variometer that you've seen working earlier on for the effects of stick lift. If we remember something that energy is made up of two parts, the one is potential energy, in other words, the energy we have due to height above the ground, for example, and the energy we have due to moving forward or kinetic energy. So total energy is the sum of two forms of energy, potential energy due to gravity in this case and kinetic energy due to speed in this case. An uncompensated variometer will display stick movements. So you push forward, it's going to show you going down, and not necessarily because the, you, what you really want to find out is what the air mass is doing. So we've got to play some tricks on this thing. That's when you get to a total energy compensated variometer. This is achieved by putting a little tube back on the front of the aircraft or it stands upright in the, in the airflow and it has a little hole on its back end, on the, on, the, on the far side of the airflow, creating a suction. This is called the Braunschweig tube, total energy probe, a venturi, whatever. Tube vented to the airstream in such a way that suction over the tube increases with speed to compensate for the increased rate of descent caused by the increased speed. So all you want to know is what you are doing inside the air mass. 
Uh, very wordy, but it's the only way to really, really try and explain this. In a stick-induced climb, the suction will decrease. Why? Because you're slowing down to compensate for the climb due to the reduction of speed of the airflow over the instrument. So you're going to get a reduced suction. Therefore, what you're trying to do is, because if you weren't compensated, you pull the stick back, the instrument's going to show up. You're now adding a reduced suction, which is going to pull the needle down, and it'll stay at zero. It'll say to you, OK, you've pulled the stick up, but you're not in upgoing air. We just want to know if we're in upgoing air, which is called a the thermal. We don't want to know what the airplane is doing. Which is summed up in this at any given moment. While the speed is changing, the total energy variometer reads as though the glider were flying steady at the speed indicated at that moment, that vertical speed indicated at that moment. So questions at this point, just to try and get that all nestled into your mind. So if anyone, any if anyone has any questions, just raise their hands. And, and in simple terms, what I think I'm hearing, Tom, is that the total energy vario reads both the static pressure as well as the dynamic or the pitot pressure, and it puts those two values together and, and, and compensates when you speed up or slow down um, so that it doesn't give a false reading. You know, we can skip through the next 10 slides. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you guys understand it like that, the next 10 slides are unimportant. <laughs> so again, raise any hands if you've got any questions. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll let Tom continue on. All right. All right. There's your static pressure that's connected to your instrument, to the static port on the instrument. There's the other side of it, which goes to your reference chamber. That is what you're seeing right now is exactly what you see in this bottom picture that we referenced earlier on. A standard uncompensated variometer. Stick gets pulled back, lower static due to the increase in altitude, so the static pressure here, here drops. There's a flow from your reference chamber out through your instrument to your static, which indicates a climb on the instrument. Now, I remember your total energy is equal to potential energy and kinetic energy story, and the fact that we now want to introduce the fact that we're changing speed into the equation whilst we're pulling the stick back. This brings airspeed into play. You have your Braunschweig tube which is connected to a diaphragm, in this, in this, in this drawing, a diaphragm type uh, total energy compensator. We have these in the Crosno. So anybody who's flying a Crosno, it's a red brown device that you'll see under the instrument cover. I'm just going to clear that ink away. So as you, as you can see here, any change in direction of airflow here will make a change in the diaphragm. And any change of, air, of static pressure over here will try and flow out through the reference or into the reference or get taken up in the compensator. The whole idea is for it to be taken up in the compensator so that when you pull the stick back, it shows zero. Airspeed decreases. You get a lower pressure on the Brunswick tube. Decreased Brunswick pressure causes deflection of the diaphragm. Energy is a equalization is absorbed in that diaphragm. And you get a resultant zero vario reading. So you're playing off a suction created by airspeed or a lack of suction, a lesser suction when the airspeed decreases against a decrease in static pressure, and that gives you a total compensated variometer. Questions on that one? I'll take it back to that picture, and we'll try and discuss this thing so that it makes sense to everybody. Please yeah, raise your hands or type a question or whatever David sees you do on the other side. So I see I, I have a column of, of where, where people, when they raise their hands, I see a little icon pop up. So no hands coming up, so I think they might have it. 
we, we, we can open the discussion. With this, this one is not an easy one to fathom. Do you want me to unmute if everyone? You want to, uh, if you want to unmute, and let's just we can talk around this one because we're pretty much close to the end of our presentation. All right, so I'm just unmuting everyone. So what do you guys think about this? I think you have to keep yeah. it in the very basic yeah. terms. It's the, you know, it makes sense the way Tom explained it. I think he did a really good job. Um, names yeah, so I'm going to ask you a very complicated. simple. I'll ask you a very simple question. Why do we want to have a total compensated variometer? So well, for a simple fact, if you don't want to. Sorry, Karen, yeah. say again. You, you can, Karen? Karen, we lost her. She said, well, yeah. so, yeah, so we know when we go up in the thermal. Yeah, so we know when we go, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Well, effectively, what we want to determine is that the increase in altitude or the blowing up that we're seeing is actually from the thermal, mm -hmm. from the entire air mass blowing up as opposed to what we're doing in the air mass. And that's what a variometer, compensated variometer, should tell you. Well, if everybody's vaguely comfortable with that, we'll move on to the final instruments, the compass, etc. Okay, so well, first of all, we'll get to the McCready ring, and then to the... Okay, you guys might have all heard of the concept of speed to fly and the McCready ring. This will also be addressed further in, I think, cross-country section where you'll be talking about polar curves and how they all work. Yep. McCready ring is based on the data from a polar curve. Really what it's telling you is if you're in a given air mass, what speed you should be flying at. If you're in an air mass that's going up, should you be slowing down or going faster? If you're in air mass that's going down, should you be slowing down or going faster? So let's get a picture of a Variometer on a poo hatch with the McCready ring around it. The McCready ring is this outer bezel that you see over here. It's got calibrations in knots in it. It, it says it's in knots. It's got a triangle on it, which is its indicator position. Then you've got 40, 50, 70, 80, 90, 100 knots on the bottom here. And you can rotate this ring around the variometer as you go. So the concept of speed to fly we did speak about and it really boils down to the less time you spend in sync, the less altitude you'll lose. Conversely, the more time you spend in lift, the more altitude you'll gain. So therefore, if you get into a situation of lift and you want to gain altitude, you will slow your plane down to stay in the rising air longer. If you find yourself in sinking air, you will speed your plane up to cross that sinking air faster. I said to you earlier, it's based on the polar curve, and the McCready ring is calibrated to the polar curve's optimum flying position. Speed to fly, needle indication is referenced on the McCready ring, and I really can't remember if we have any I might have the McCready ring changing. Yes, I did. So the next good thing over there, you're expecting lift of three knots ahead of you. So this needle up here is going to be moving up to three knots. You should be flying at the speed of 65 through that lift. That's really what it's telling you. And similarly, if you if if you've got down going air, so let's 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 say we move this triangle down to four knot sink. You're going to be finding that you have to f fly a hell of a lot faster to get through the the, the sink um, effectively. So through lift, there it's going up, and your speeds are sitting around it. That brings us now to the final or variometers. In modern aircraft, the old mechanical variometer is no longer there. There's no, it's all electronics, it's all piped in, it's got transducers, electronic transducers, heat sensors, you know, as the air goes through an orifice it increases in heat. 
So the airflow is detected by a cooling effect on thermistors, etc. You, everything is totally electronic. So you have an electronic meter, which has also got audio in it. So when you're going up, it starts going bidi 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 bidi. When you go down, it gets in the, in, into the, the horrible side, which goes burp, 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 burp. On our club aircraft, we've turned the burp, burp, burp off because it can be fairly unnerving if it doesn't want to stop. You know you're getting closer to the ground. You can also select the sensitivity of this instrument. It's fully, uh, it can be electronically total energy compensated. And it has a built-in McCready setting on this particular instrument here. You've got the McCready. You can say, I'm expecting four meters lift ahead of me. Therefore, uh, that's what I'm going to fly to. And sorry, I'm going to take you back to this over here and just describe what you're seeing here. I, I didn't do it too well earlier on. You set the triangle at three meters expected lift of your next thermal because the last thermal you came out of gave you five meters a second in a turn or five knots. Correct me, I learned to fly in meters a second. So you, you're thinking you're going to get um, three knots in your next thing. The speed you fly at is indicated by the position of this needle. If you're getting into lift, you're slowing down. If the needle tells you you're in sync, you're increasing speed. So let's say you get into four knots of sync. It's telling you to fly through that at roughly 93 knots. I hope that makes a bit more sense than my previous um, description of that. Finally, we get to the compass. So one of these instruments that is uh, deemed by law to be necessary in your aircraft before you take off. Also, one of the most inaccurate instruments that you can possibly have. Quick going through the construction of the compass. You've got a paraffin liquid inside, which is, I believe, kerosene in North American terms. Two magnets attached to a float, which is attached to a compass card inside. The whole thing is mounted uh, on a pivot in a casing, free to rotate. So you've got this area, this area here that you see here, is mounted on a pivot over there, and it can rotate within this chamber. Filled with alcohol, the white kerosene prevents oscillations. It just smooths it down, lubricates it, etc. It has the lubber line on it, this white line across the front, which is where you read the instrument. So this particular one is indicating that you're traveling between 240 and west, which is 270. And it's pretty much halfway in between. So it's not west, and it's not, what's the one before that, south, southwest. Headings are painted on the opposite face of the card. If you're on a compass card and swings in the aircraft direction. So that's your compass. Yeah, it's a very, very delicate instrument. Shouldn't be dropped and banged. It will tell you in which direction you're actually flying based on magnetic north. So a compass works on the Earth's magnetic field. Magnetic north pole is not the geographic north pole. I believe the magnetic north pole is somewhere to the west and somewhere south of the pole in the top of Canada. David, do you have any idea where it currently is or anybody from that neck of the woods? It's, uh, I think we're at about 11 degrees west right now, somewhere in that range. Yeah. But the actual magnetic pole is, is somewhere in, yeah, I don't know, what, what one of the Northwest Territories. Oh, yeah, right, 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 where it's actually located, yeah. yeah. Where Google it's it. actually located. <laughs> So the compass always points to the magnetic pole. So the closer you are to the magnetic pole, my golly, it's going to be far out because it's not going to point to Santa's home at all. Uh, where we are in Ontario, the difference between the what the compass is telling you and true north is 11 degrees west. The compass is being pulled to the west more than it is being pulled to the north. So we have a magnetic variation of 11 degrees. Brings you to magnetic variation. Convert from true heading to magnetic heading what the compass reads. The compass always reads magnetic heading. West is best. So 
if it's a westerly variation like 11 degrees west, then you'll find this notated on all the flying maps. As you move further west over the map of Canada, the variation should decrease. As you move for further to the east, it should increase. West is best you add the westerly variation to from add westerly variation from the true heading. So east is least subtracted. Subtract easterly variation from the true heading, and you can work out where you're going in that. Compass is affected by magnetic dip, so it's being pulled by the magnetic pole. So the closer you get to the pole, the more it's going to try and pull it over on the little spindle on which it rests through here. I'm going to go over these things very quickly. they wonderfully described and from the ground up way better than I could ever explain it to you. Uh, there is a compensation for magnetic dip. The compass magnet system is balanced to hang like a pendulum on a pivot, so that the center of gravity of the system is lower than the point of pivot. So therefore, it's pivoting somewhere up here with the center of gravity lying down here somewhere. And or that the center of buoyancy is well above the center of gravity. Same thing, counteracts dip to the extent at normal latitudes that we fly at the angle of dip is only two to three degrees. But if you get into the higher lats, uh, closer to the pole area, you're going to see a much greater dip. It's going to want to pull the compass over. Compass has many errors that we need to be aware of. First one is called deviation. Deviation has got nothing to do with um, where the the magnetic north pole is. It's purely got to do with where that compass is, has been installed, what other metallic magnetic objects are close to it, what electrical equipment might be creating an electrical field or a magnetic field around it. It will deflect the compass, any of those things. The compensation that's done for that is called swinging. You point the aircraft in the four compass directions. You read the readings, and you generate yourself a table. So check them compensated periodically. There are little compensating magnets that you can use to try and adjust it back. Those are hidden underneath this cover plate over here. At the end of the day, you point it at magnetic north. And you get the reading, and it says 359. So you steer one degree to the one side of magnetic north. Let's say you wanted to go south. No, you've got to steer 183 to go south. And so it varies throughout the thing. Here, the only in this particular compass guide, which is something that's meant to be placed beneath every compass, when you're traveling at 120 degrees, you're actually traveling at 120 degrees in that direction, and at 300. Just about everything else has got little corrections in it. Further errors of the compass. When reading the compass while holding a north-south heading, make sure the wings are level. If your wings aren't level traveling north or south, you're not going to get a good reading on the compass. When reading the compass, when holding an east or a west heading, make sure that you don't change your airspeed. Now, the the reasons for all of this, as I say, are well described and from the ground up. It would take us way too long to go through it. And I'm not too sure whether it's the most important instrument to have, have dwelled on. Finally, other instruments you might find in, in a glider or Instrumentation, GPSs are coming in. This GPS that you see over here is, I think, 20 years old. Right now, on my cell phone, I am using XC-SOAR. It's using the magnetometer in my cell phone. It's using the accelerometers in my cell phone. It's using the um, the altimeter, the, the, I can't think of the word, the bar barometric sensor in there to get altitude. It's also getting altitude from the GPS satellites. It's showing me the direction I'm traveling in. It's even telling me where the center of a the thermal is. These are all other modern, modern instruments. There's a variety of touch panel instrumentation that you can put in your plane now, moving maps, etc. Things have come a long way from the stock standard instruments that I've described to you today. 
these all being able to work without the help of any batteries, so you're not going to go wrong with them. You quite okay to put any of them in your aircraft, but never get rid of those instruments that will work when your battery goes down, and those instruments that are really easy to read and easy to understand and that you don't have to spend three days working out how to use. We had a, an interesting in, incident at our club where one of our pilots took off and he was using iMap or God knows what you get on an iPhone. And he had set it to, I don't know what he set it to, but anyway, the resultant was that he got off tow at 1,200 feet as opposed to 2,000 feet and wondered why he was so low and so far away from the circuit. That's my, my final point on all the modern devices. Learn to use them correctly before putting them in the cockpit and overloading yourself. We've very successfully learned how to use cross-country saw, XC saw, hooked up to the soaring simulator software Condor. We've got that set up in the clubhouse. You can literally fly the simulator and have the XC saw running on your iPhone, or not your iPhone, your, your Android device, or I've got it running on a Kobo reader now and be able to stop it and work out how to use it without falling out of the sky or getting distracted. Anyway, that's the end of it from me. So, open discussion. Um, hey. Over to you, David. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm just going to unmute everyone and just go down the list here. All right. Any uh, questions? Everybody. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, David, yeah. staying just before everybody uh, logs off, just go everybody grab the handout. Um, last for this week, right? Thank you for reminding me. Yes, please do grab that handout. Um, I'm just nice. take back over here, and I just thought it'd be kind of fun. As Tom was talking, I went and googled this, and you found I found one. Yes. So if you remember the, the the graphic that had the two balls with the air flowing in and air flowing out, so this is actually the instrument panel level 126, and these two tubes here. <laughs> Are the, That's beautiful to oh, see. <laughs> isn't it great? It's an original variometer. So when the red ball was going up, you were sinking. And then when the green ball was going up, you were you were climbing. That's beautiful. So that's the original variometer. You've also, in that same picture, you've got a um, turn and slip or a ball indicator in the bottom just below it. Yeah, right here. Uh, which is the, the, other, the reversed version of the yaw string. Yeah. As you can see, you've got a compass over there, and right next to that compass is that compass card I told you about. Which, which you actually have to have by law. If, if you have a compass, by you law, have to have a compass card. Have have and you've got your airspeed indicator and your altimeter. The only thing I'm not seeing there is a clock on the dashboard, which is on the guy's wrist. That's it. In those days, you still wore watches. And, and this, this little yeah, funny thing is the vent. <laughs> Okay, so if there's no other questions, I'll leave it uh, on for a few moments while people will do the downloads. You know where to find us. Um, I don't remember what the topic is for next week, but I think it's uh, circuits. And um, I think in two weeks we're going to be doing cross-country. It's either next week or in two weeks. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you when you log in, and don't forget to do your well, I think, I think we, should, we should do our um, sources of lift before the cross country. Sources of lift. Thank you, Tom. That's right. We're going to think that's what for two weeks time. That's the one. Yep. Next week. Okay. I, I actually have a quick one. Yes. And in really more from the previous chapter, I just wrote it down, but I didn't have a chance to ask it. Uh, the previous chapter, we spoke a lot for different procedures for pre-takeoff, pre-landing, what's not. Uh, but we never really talk about a procedure. How do you have? How do you leave the airplane if needed? How do you pretty much jump jump off? Like to bail when, out. Yeah, exactly. So okay. that cover this in this course. We we, so we, when do, how, we don't yeah, normally. What, is the, what is the steps? So so we don't normally, but let let's let's go through that right now. Um, the first thing you want to do before you eject the canopy is undo your straps. Because once that canopy goes, uh, all kinds of stuff is going to be flying around, and it's it's going to be very chaotic. Um, so the, the the best thing you want to do is kind of prepare yourself before you you release the canopy. 
under your straps, eject the canopy. And at that point, it's get out however you can, because the only reason you're going to bail out is that airplane is no longer controllable. So likely you will be in um, uh, a spin or a dive or upside down or flipping around. And, and really, quite honestly, if you did get into that kind of a scenario, um, under, your, under your main straps, eject that canopy and then just either roll out or push yourself out or, or, or get out somehow. And as soon as you're clear, pull your, your uh, ripcord. As soon as you're clear of what you think is the, the tail plane. Yeah, what you think is the airplane in general, yeah. Yeah, in, in general. And yeah, well, we can talk about that one day on the field. Yeah. But it's it's one of those things where if you if you're bailing out, you've probably lost a part of your airplane, and if you've lost a wing and one is in and one is out, it's going to be spinning violently. Um, if you've lost the tail, it's probably going to be flipping nose over tail. You know, it, it's you know under your straps, eject that canopy, and and then just get out however you can. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, from what I've been told, from people that have actually bailed. The centrifugal forces, when that aircraft's rotating, push you very firmly into the seat. You yeah. really have to work it out. It, it'll either push you in or push you out, right? Because yeah. uh, depending upon how it's rotating, but most of the people I've I've ever talked to, it's it's yeah, you get pushed in. And there there is actually well, a, a video. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 hey, we, we, we always are on the side of safety, and the more you talk about it, all the funny things, the better. Yeah, so there's there there's there's what it will look like, and and this gentleman, they had a mid-air collision, his wing's broken, that airplane's now rotating, and he's he's on his way out. He lived. No one was hurt. That's a wonderful picture. Isn't that brilliant? Is that crazy? Holy cow. Yeah. So uh, this is why you guys want to wear parachutes on all flights. Just saying. <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's call it a night, and we'll see y'all next week. And we'll see y'all next week. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom.